Hello and welcome to another edition of But Have You Heard About? I am your host, Courtney, and today we have a special panel of wonderful ladies with me today. This, they are actually from my former, well, I want to say former, because technically we're still Girl Scouts, or at least in my mind, in my heart, we're still Girl Scouts. These two lovely ladies were Girl Scouts with me when I was younger. I have Caroline and I have Jamie. Hello. Hello. You may be wondering, hmm, why is this podcast titled about Girl Scouts and also Girl Scout people here? Because we're going to talk about the founder of Girl Scouts. Julia Gordon Lowe. There's a lot of, I wouldn't say misconceptions, but she honestly should have had a movie made about her by now, just because of everything she kind of went through and the fact that she's a product of her time, but also propelling girls to be more than just seamstresses at home. Just reading over some of her biographies and stuff and like some of the tidbits. I mean, she was, first off, she was born right before the Civil War in Savannah, Georgia. Her mom was from the North, I believe Chicago area. And was very anti-slavery, but because that literally is how her husband made his money, to have that elite lifestyle that they had in Savannah, she couldn't really be like, we can't, we can't, we can't have anything to do with slaves. They didn't own slaves, but they worked within the cotton producing business aspect of it. And during the war, they actually had Union soldiers from the North come and hang out with them during like the whole invasion of Savannah and the burning of Georgia. And I thought that was kind of weird and interesting. And that's just such a weird tidbit that she got to be like a toddler during the Civil War. Um, and her father was a Confederate soldier and she was hanging out with Northern Union soldiers when they came to Georgia. Anyways, so she was born in 1860. She had, a again, a very privileged lifestyle growing up, you know, with money in Savannah. She got to go to Debbie Town Ball. She went to school, which was not very common for late 1800s. And that's where she actually met her husband through a friend of hers from school. They got married. She was also born partially deaf in one ear. And when she was married during the celebratory rice stage that they have at the end of a lot of weddings that a lot of people don't do anymore. They did like fireworks and like little sprinklers and those are super cute. But she actually had one of the grains of rice lodged in her ear and it was in her good ear. And while it was kind of blocking the sound they eventually decided like, okay, we're going to take it out. Well, when they went to go take it out, they actually ruptured her eardrum, making her fully deaf in that ear. So she had such little hearing and, you know, she's a young lady. She was just married. And it was one of those where you're like, man, that's, that kind of sucks. By the early 1900s, they moved over to London or over to England and found out that her husband had a mistress who was an actress and instead of causing embarrassment by getting a divorce, they decided to separate. He lived at one house. She lived in another house. And literally, that's how they decided they were going to live for a while until they wanted to have a divorce. During the divorce proceedings, he died. In his will, and his testament, he left everything to the mistress, though. Like, that would make me a little perturbed. But that's just me. I don't know about y'all, but if my husband had a mistress and left everything and he had all the money, because that's how it was back in the 19, early 1900s. I would be a little upset, but she contested it. She did get um, a small sum. So she was able to live on her own and all that, but she stayed in London for a while because she enjoyed being over there. She had made a lot of friends propelling her onto this Girl Scout path. She went to a luncheon and she met a uh, Lord Baden Powell, who was the founder of Boy Scouts over in London. And they got to talking and she was like, this sounds so amazing. It would be fabulous if we could do this for girls. So Boy Scouts, Lord Baden Powell, he fought in the Boer War, which is a South African war. And it started in the late 1800s. During the Boer War, he was just noticed that a lot of the young men were lacking in skills. And he was like, we should remedy this by coming up with scouts. <laughs> and that's kind of how Boy Scouts started. Got to make those little little soldier boys. Exactly. Baden Powell wrote A Guide to Scouting, and it was published in 1908, and the Boer War had ended in 1902. It was a bestseller and initially meant for military purposes after the war, and he felt he could be used as a focus for young boys to give them more meaning in life. And again, that led to the creation of the Scout Movement. So that's 1908. He meets Daisy, Julia Gordon Lowe, 1911. So Boy Scouts, the whole movement in London – is going for a couple years and she literally had this good fortune to be seated next to him. And we didn't talk about it, but so Julie Gordon Lowe, her nickname is Daisy. Daisy was a very popular nickname, apparently in the late 1800s. I didn't know this. Did y'all know that? I had heard it on something. Whatever Probably something about Julia Gordon Lowe. Yeah. <laughs> so you have Daisy, which is also where we get one of the namesakes for the levels for Girl Scouts. 
Daisy's over here talking to Baden Powell and hearing about his accomplishments and everything. And she is just so impressed by everything that he's done for the Boy Scouts and that he also has a girl version. They are called Girl Guides. So if there's ever a debate or you ever have a trivia fun question of who came first, Girl Guides or Girl Scouts, it's Girl Guides, just FYI. So anyways, the two of them became super good friends and he encouraged her to do something useful with her life. And the usefulness with her life basically put her on this path to being like, I want to empower young girls and I want to, you know, I want you to be able to stand on your own two feet in a sense because she got married. She was deaf by the, within a few months of being married, she was mostly deaf. She also had a husband who cheated on her. She had, she felt she had nothing, like no purpose, no nothing. And she had such a creative imagination when she was a child. And she did more than just what you would expect somebody in the 1870s to be doing in Savannah, Georgia or the 1880s. I also read, and I found it interesting that she was a pretty sickly child. She just, she had always been sick and like entertained herself inside, put on plays and things like that. And I read a lot. So she always wanted to like learn about everything because she couldn't really do much physically anyway, already limited because she was just a girl during that time. Thank you for bringing that up. This is going to be like a PSA for Girl Scouts, but Girl Scouts literally does encompass everybody and they make a way for everybody to be able to do everything in Girl Scouts, which I love, especially like when we were growing up, even before that, there really weren't as many safe spaces, not to be like, it's a safe space, but calling it a safe space for girls to be girls without having the other peers there like boys that necessarily could take away the conversation or just be better at anything physical. So I personally enjoyed that. But yeah, so she had just such a different type of life you would expect. And for her to get to where she was, I think was great. So 1911, she decides basically to start her own girl guide troop up in Scotland. So she's a leader in Scotland and she decides, you know what, in early 1912, she's going to go back to Savannah, Georgia. And literally on the boat, the steamer that they went on, it's not like they're going to go that fast. It's 1912. It's Titanic time. She's on the same boat as Sir Robert over here. And they literally talk the whole way. He's like, yes, you need to make sure that you're doing something with your life. And if you want to do something, do it. So she started Girl Scouts or like that was like her whole idea on the ship. She was like, I'm going to do this when I get home to Savannah because she was left the house in Savannah or she was given the house um, after the whole contestion of the will of her late husband. So she had the house in Savannah and she's like, I'm going to go back to Savannah. I'm going to start a Girl Scout troop. So the very first Girl Scout troop. Oh, I got to find how many it was. 18. 18. I knew that one. She originally was going to call the Girl Scouts Girl Guides in America to kind of play off of the Boy Scouts and the Girl Guides that already existed. She showed up um, on March 12th, 1912 to have the first Girl Guides meeting, and it was held in Savannah, Georgia. And as Caroline pointed out to me a hot minute ago, there were 18 girls that were there for the very first time. And they came from, you know, not just people of family that she knew, but who the first one was. No, who was the first girl that signed up? Her niece, who was named Daisy after her. I did that since she was her niece, that she got to be the first that she started. I didn't know that. In 1913, though, so a year later, after they've started this movement of being like, okay, we're going to sign up girls, they moved their headquarters to Washington, D.C., and they actually changed the name from Girl Guides in America to Girl Scouts of the United States of America. One thing that you didn't mention that was that her husband kind of anti-feminist is what they had said. And so it seemed like whenever she was starting it up that she kind of had to hide it or maybe not hide it, but. Yeah. But also because like he left her alone all the time because he was off doing affairs and like gambling and stuff, generally being a crappy husband. Yeah. Um, And so she was like, whatever, I'm going to do my own thing. And so she had all these hobbies and like, I saw like woodworking and like metalworking like she built their iron gate and all these things like that's really cool but yeah so he was just like can you calm down and be normal and whatever it could be yeah a lady at home or whatever yeah and I think she would have done or she would have started something like this earlier if she had gone back to the states but I mean while she was married because you are married and as a woman in the early 1900s the late 1800s you have to do what your husband says Yeah. So I heard like, yeah, she was going to, she was already interested in creating these um, like an educational program for girls to try to have them be like the best wives and mothers that they possibly could. If you're going to have to cook, learn how to do it really well. If you, you know, and how to keep a sterile kitchen and all these things. 
And like, that's cool. But then by the time her husband died and then World War One, it was like, oh, we need to be able to do more than just. <laughs> and I thought it was really interesting that that's what they talked about was, you know, they're, they're pushing to be better wives because you know, that's where you're going to end up anyway. And that seems to be a common misconception now, even that like, that's why everybody talks about the girls, people who are very passionate about the girls being in BSA are all about, well, all they do over there is learn to cook and sew, but I like both organizations, but our girls, like from our troop, that's not how most ended up. We ended up with such a big variety of girls who do completely different, maybe not all girl typical things, you know? Yeah, yeah. honestly, like Boy Scouts is more restricted in the activities that they do. And then girls, it's like, why. okay, whatever you want to do, we'll empower you to do it, you know? Right. Yes. But it's not just cooking and sewing and doing your wifely duties yeah. or, you know, like they're doing sailing and archery and we have girls that do all kinds of girls. Because she wanted you to, you know, find that passion yeah. in, a, in a way, you know, if you're going to be a mom, like you, again, you need to be the best that you can be. Totally love that thing that you guys had and having the ability to pursue things that you like, even though she was home all the time as a child because she was sickly, she still got to at least experience things, you know, through books or through her own activities by entertaining herself. And I think having been a Girl Scout and um, working for Girl Scouts, it really is a lot of what do you want to do? We'll figure out a way to incorporate it because there's nothing that says you can't, you know, no isn't really a word that you hear often unless it's like really not um, age appropriate. (laughs) But I was like, but still, we did stuff that we probably weren't supposed to do. And even people that have, you know, you have restrictions, but that's not a reason you can't do that because there's always a workaround. Like with her, with her um, hearing disability, then she found ways to work around that instead of just saying, well, I can't do, you know, I can't do this or that, or I don't have a purpose because of. No, that's actually really good. And I think because of who she was and how she founded it, it was very much, it needs to incorporate everybody. So it's not just limited also to one socioeconomic class either. Like Girl Scouts is pretty affordable um, for a year's membership. And they make a point to be like, if you really want to be in it, most Girl Scout councils will totally help you out, get you in if you need to get in. Um, I know there's a whole misconception that everybody thinks all Girl Scouts is is cookies. And um, I'll be completely honest. I have Girl Scout cookies in my pantry right now because Girl Scout cookies are like... They're better than the Boy Scout popcorn. Look, anything's better. <laughs> or than the popcorn. coupon books. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like our fall, the fall nut sales are pretty cool. <laughs> Fun tidbit: the very first Girl Scout cookie was made it, or was sold in 1917, and I believe it was in Philadelphia. I ran by a sign during a half marathon that said that. I took a photo. That's the only reason cookies? I remember. That's what I had. I had just read that it was sugar cookies, and it. Yeah, sugar cookies made them in Philadelphia in 1917. But yeah, like during like the war efforts, uh, during World War One, World War Two, they wanted the girls to learn more first aid skills. And we talked about that. We touched on this really briefly beforehand. Where I asked, I asked uh, Caroline and Jamie what their most ex- like favorite things, not favorite, but an exciting or thoughtful memory from Girl Scouts. And Jamie had mentioned that we had done the Red Cross babysitter class training. Yeah, so we learned like how to give baby CPR, which I. <laughs> found uh pretty amusing to like okay put this little doll over your your quadricep and just like slam your hand right into the back <laughs> really a, really powerful memory <laughs> it's a good visual <laughs> you still remember it <laughs> there's a lot about Julie Gordon Lowe and I really do wish that that there really would be like a movie the only movie I can think of for Girl Scouts is True Beverly Hills and it's not even really about Girl Scouts. It's like a girl version of Boy Scout. It was about our Girl Scouts, so that's what I always say. Our troop was tro- very true Beverly Hills. We don't camp in tents without AC and running and toilets. toilets. Uh, that yeah. was annoying to me because <laughs> I was I was like the like the last one. I joined in in, in your troop in fifth grade, and so there was already this very established social dynamic with (laughs) y'all i came from uh rural illinois and we went i went camping in tents and you know just i was used to that and then coming in there and then (laughs) 
Yeah. I have, I've adjusted as an adult, but I still prefer to have flushing toilets. You will never sell me in latrines. No. Now, as a grown-ass adult woman, I refuse to not have, like, I do not go camping. And when I worked at Girl Scouts and they told me I had to go camping, I made the worst face. And I was like, nobody said I had to do that to be a part of my job. Yeah. I prefer to have a zipper on my tent or a door that closes. I don't like platform tents. Oh, I like to zip the bugs out. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, having the zippers is nice, especially in this climate. I remember very vividly, we were in like, oh, it had to be second or first grade that we went camping and we did overnight camping. And we went up to Conroe and it was like February and Ooh, it was like our wet. weekend or something. And I just remember it being so cold. Like I could never, I couldn't get warm enough to go to sleep. Yeah. Being cold and wet and camping is the worst, but and, uh, yeah, we were in platform tents. It was the worst. Yeah, that was like first year for that one. No, you were lucky. Well, cause my trip disbanded in fifth grade. And so after fifth grade is when I joined y'all. And I'm three years older, so yeah, we were in like I guess in third grade when y'all were in third grade is when I would have joined y'all afterwards. Yeah, so you got to hang out with us. Look, I guess if our leader was here, she could have told us these dates, but slacking off as usual. Per (laughs) use, per (laughs) usual. Um, So, other little known facts to keep Girl Scouts running because it wasn't like she was trying to make money off of Girl Scouts. She, Julie Gordon Lowe actually sold her pearls. And so one of a sim, like one of the symbolic things with Girl Scouts is pearls because she sold her pearls to keep Girl Scouts going. Well, like it's a symbolic thing. I wouldn't call it maybe a symbol. It's a thing. I know that she sold her pearl necklace and I know that her cheating husband gave her syphilis. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I know that for some reason when she had uh, cancer, I mean, she eventually died from cancer, but one of the treatments was uh, ingesting lead. Oh, yes. Like, dang, dang. And it didn't work for some reason. For some reason. Yeah. Some reason. And Justin led. The fact that she lived after doing that for like a hot minute is uh, I mean, pretty notable. There's still people today telling you to ingest Clorox. So, I mean, I guess there's alternate treatments maybe who weren't always questioned. <laughs> and we also used to put mercury into our bodies. So My aunt used to play with it in her hand when she was a kid. Her and her friends, they did not even. The things you don't know that yeah. now I'm happy we do know because of science. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't long to have lived in a different era. No. So yeah, Girl Scouts, Julie Gordon Lowe, she did pass away from breast cancer, as you mentioned. And so I find it like, I not like ironic, but it's a nice and fitting her birthday being in October, which also happens to be Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And it's just kind of like a nice tie-in. And the fact that she was kind of a badass woman to do what she did by herself in a sense. I mean, she did come from privilege. She came from a good, well upbringing. And so she had, you know, she was afforded the abilities to have these ideas and kind of run with them, but she did kind of have to wait for her husband to die. So Caroline, would you like to tell us your favorite memory? I don't know. I have, a, I have a lot of good memories. I think the thing that sticks out to me the most that I mentioned the most is just where our girls ended up because it's such a big variety where we do have some, a couple, you know, good moms out of the bunch that did the wife mom thing, but we have such a big variety and where everybody ended up, ended up being really passionate about completely different things. And we had, you know, Jessica went to the military and was in law school and then you know, Amber's a plumber of all things. And then you're working with pets and Jamie's doing psychology and yeah. I'm leaving everybody out. But I, I just think that the variety that we ended up with was really neat. And I mean, I wouldn't say like there was just one incident, like what this one incident in Girl Scouts that propelled me to my career. But I think knowing that you had the ability to be like, it's okay if you, you don't succeed the first try, like the first mm-hmm. time. Yeah. Um, I think that was a something that just kind of stuck with me. Well, and that you don't have to like everything. You don't have to be good at everything. You can try things and maybe that's not going to be your thing, but you could try it out. And I mean, you did archery and stuff like that and actually sailed and worked for NASA. I mean, I don't know. I think, I just think the variety that came out of it is cool when everybody you talk to just thinks that girls do nothing but sell cookies and learn how to cook. Yeah. I don't know. But even then I enjoyed selling the cookies. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, standing outside of stores and everything. I mean, 
we had a lot of fun times. Well, and there's also, more to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I got to experience kind of initiating contact with people like just, okay. Like it kind of taught some uh, initiative and just stepping outside of comfort zones and learning yeah. social skills and learning, right. you know, entrepreneurship and make setting a goal and reaching it. I mean, this year, our troop, we set a goal of 1500 packages and I thought the moms were going to fall out of their chairs. And then they sold like 3,200 packages by the end of it. And Lily sold over 600, which yeah. I thought I was doing good selling 300 when I was a kid. So <laughs> I was say one thing um, that one of the things I was watching, uh, a kid had asked a Juliet Gordon Lowe impersonator what, how she got her volunteers. And she said that she would have tea parties and then she would tell her friends and the ladies that she knew and the ones that were really good around kids and then ones that she just knew. She would tell them about it and get them all hyped up and excited. And then that way they couldn't say no. So maybe we need to start having some more tea parties. So is there anything that you guys want to mention that you guys maybe read when you're thinking about or things you remember from being a Girl Scout, either about Julia Gordon Lowe or even like the history in general of Girl Scouts? I didn't want to go into a huge thing talking about Girl Scouts, but obviously it's evolved over the years. What does it tend to look like with like teenagers these days? From my perspective, a lot of girls are still dropping off in like middle school just because you are fighting for attention, depending on like whatever their passion is. But the girls that are in Girl Scouts, but the ones that I got to know were impassioned by Girl Scouts and they really liked what they were doing. Um, And they would kind of use their other stuff that they were doing for those service hours still getting those higher awards because they look really good on, you know, a college application for your Girl Scout Gold Award, which is the equivalent of the Boy Scouts Eagle Award. It still has that same level of you started a project. Girls that finish that, I think, like if you see that and it's a goal you want to obtain, you stick around and you stay in Girl Scouts for that. I think that they have a lot more like freedom and ability to do things. Like I don't remember having half of the fun programs when I was in high school or like I think Girl Scouts opens up doors, and I think that... I got a job because I was a Girl Scout who was in college. Right. It was just a work-study job. The person who was hiring, she was a Girl Scout leader, and she saw that on my resume and just point blank said, oh, you're a Girl Scout, and like just, that, was, that was a deciding factor for me. That was in educational psychology research, and so that definitely like influenced me. Mm-hmm. It was are there any last remarks you guys want to make about either Julie Gordon Lowe or Girl Scouts? I'm glad it's still going on and it's a, it's a good organization. On that note, I'm going to end this lovely episode of Ms. Daisy, Julie Gordon Lowe and Girl Scouts. With that, I hope you guys have a fabulous rest of your day. Thanks again for listening. I'm Courtney. I'm joined by Caroline and Jamie and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Bye.